That's from Singapore. <laughs> yes. Wow. Very cool. Okay. Well, well, thank you for the warm welcome. I don't want to talk too much because I, you know, I don't want to bore you with too much. But I want to know a little bit more about what you are doing. Um, it's very interesting for me because, as we just mentioned, you know, one day in 2011, he, sh he showed up in the south of Switzerland with the whole family. No, to, to, to come and attend the workshop to learn about Arduino. And, I, and it was very interesting for us to see somebody coming from so far away to, to learn this thing. And, uh, and also, I'm very, I'm very impressed in the work that, that you have done to kind of you know, rally the, the, the makers here in, in Singapore and, and the space like this. And, uh, and I think it's also very interesting that you are a teacher by, by training. No? And, and, um, and we were discussing today about how it is now important to, to start teaching this kind of stuff in school. You know, because when I started working on Arduino, I was in a master's degree uh, for, I was teaching in a master's degree for designers, specifically interaction designers, so that the prototyping aspect is very important. And, and really kind of functioning prototypes was a very important idea. And I guess when I was doing this, it wasn't such an obvious thing. Like, um, like in Italy, where I come from, it's very famous for design, but they, they tend to do like non-really functioning prototypes. You know, they, there's no, there were no designers kind of messing with electronics. You know, they didn't deal with this kind of stuff. While it was much more of a northern European idea that designers should mess with electronics and mechanics and you know, everything. Well, they should be really kind of interested in using these kind of tools. And then we kind of realized that a lot of the tools, there is an interesting thing that happens in the world of technology that there is a strange resistance to make tools that simplify the life of grown-ups. Like if you're trying to make a tool for children, everybody says, oh yeah, children, we need to make tools to teach children how to code. Everybody's trying to make robots to teach kids how to code. And there's like a thousand of these robots and they're all the same because deep doing itself is good. As soon as you say, I want to make it easier for adults to understand about electronics, no. No, because grown-ups need to learn the right way, which normally means an incredibly old-fashioned way of teaching that's very theoretical, that nobody gets interested in. And so it restricts the number of people that have access to these technologies. Well, one of the ideas that I, I, I was very uh, interested in is to how, how do you create tools that enable everyday people to try to work with electronics creatively. There's also, obviously, a bit of a political element to this because if the, if the world that we live in is becoming completely digital, you know, everything is digital now. Uh, you do music with, with computers, you do cinema with computers, you do a lot of things with computers, and even like the most classic activities are, you know, yesterday I was crossing the border from Malaysia into, into Singapore, and we had to carry a, a piece of electronics into the country, and the people I was with, they checked the, the customs on a mobile phone. They had a mobile app to clear customs, which for me is like, wow. Like that's like totally 21st century, you know? Like if you cross the, into the border in Italy, they pull out a piece of paper that was printed in 1912, and they just pull out, they stamp it, you know, it's, you cross the border like you crossed the border 100 years before, no? So it's kind of, I was like, wow, this place is really, you know, in the next century. Um, I mean, we are technically in the 21st century, but a lot of countries are still stuck in the 20th century. They haven't made the transition yet. But so what I'm saying is that if the world where we live in, everything is digital, then who designs the technology that we use changes also the way that we live. And so if the number of people who are participating in innovating, in inventing things, is limited to a smaller set of the population, then it means that a smaller group of people decides how we live our digital life. And since our digital life and the real life is becoming you know, very uh, one thing, then basically they decide how we live our lives. So clearly we need a lot more people that are involved in using technology creatively. We need to 
think we need to explain to people that if you use electronic as a creative tool, it's not that you're becoming an engineer, it's a different thing, you know. Being an engineer requires a little bit more training, and, but inventing and doing creative work with electronics doesn't require you to do five years of, or three years of, you know, university. You can learn uh, something without that kind of, you can build something with less knowledge, but just enough for you to invent something, to have ideas. Also because one of the things that I noticed is that if you take a farmer and the farmer explains his problems to an engineer, the engineer will make something that kind of works you know, because the dog is that smart, very intelligent, all that. But it will never be the same as a, as a farmer that comes up with an idea because they understand what it means to be a farmer and they understand how to use the technology to fix that. And this applies to to doctors, for example. So today I met your the Minister of uh, Foreign, Affairs. Foreign Affairs of Singapore, and I was so shocked because he is an Arduino user. He knew everything about Arduino. He was making like very difficult technical questions about this. I gave him as this Wi-Fi board as the president, and we were like we were debating like encryption keys and power consumption, like. And I thought he was an engineer, and then I realized he's an eye doctor. <laughs> but then the idea is that if an eye doctor understands technologies like Arduino so well, imagine what kind of innovation he can bring to the world of his profession of being an eye doctor that somebody else will never be able to do. So that's why I think that making tools that make life simple to people is something that um, it's, very, it's very important to really enable people to innovate. And also I think it's the work that we do as makers doesn't stop at the electronics or the software. There's a lot of other things that we do that are not about electronics and software that kind of enable people. Like for example, I used to go to the Maker Faire in the US, and although there were like 100,000 people at the Maker Faire in California, I was kind of like, you know, I was a privileged person because my company paid for me to go to California, and there's a lot of people that would like to go and, and see the Maker Faire in, um, in California, but they don't have the money to go. So and I thought, I need to bring this Make a Fair to Europe, but not just a mini Make a Fair. I need to bring a Make a Fair to Europe that's like big. And so I, I worked with a bunch of people that enabled me to bring the Make a Fair to Rome in Italy. And we decided to organize it as a European Make a Fair. And so this year we had 100,000 people coming to see the fair from all over Europe, but also people from China and India came to see the Make a Fair in Rome. And we had 600 makers from 31 countries. And even that does, doesn't have anything to do with electronics. I think it's also important to create these occasions for people to meet, to understand what they're doing, to exchange. So this Make a Fair, which now is like the, was the third edition in Rome, already enabled a bunch of people to transform their ideas into companies. So there were some kids that showed up the first year with like a prototype of a 3D printer. And now they are one of the most established 3D printer companies in Europe. And so there was a lot of these things that we saw happen. So sometimes it's not about just the technology, but it's also to create uh, events, places, situations. You know, William was mentioning that we created the first Fab Lab in Italy. Because you know, I, was, I, I went to the MIT a number of times, so I saw the first Fab Lab. And then one day we were looking at the, the, some, the government uh, to make a short story, asked me to organize something uh, for a specific event that happened in Italy, and it was supposed to be something about the future of work. So the Italian way to do this would have been to take the money from the government, put some panels on the wall, and just put the money in my pocket and walk away. And then I said, no, that's not going to be it. I'm not making an exhibition about the future of work, which is a panels printed on the wall, like it's, again, 1820, you know? So let's try, so we said, let's, let's organize a work, a, a fab lab. And we realized that there were fab labs in everywhere, including Afghanistan, but there was no fab lab in Italy. So I used the money for this exhibition to create the first fab lab uh, in Italy. So in a way, you know, creating these spaces, creating these events, creating these opportunities is as important as working on the technology. So, you know, as makers, we kind of have this 
um, we make stuff, but we also kind of work with people and help them, you know, uh, learn, you know, make us learn from each other a lot. So in a way, you make stuff, but you also have an issue to help other people and, uh, you know, and that kind of stuff. So I think it's, uh, you know, what we do is can have impact. You know, I met a lot of makers uh, in these years I've been working on uh, on, on Arduino, and I've met people who have built uh, medical devices that uh, solved you know, farmers, that solved problems for farmers in South America. So there was a bunch of people that actually used the technology to effectively, positively impact people's lives. And I think this is part of what, if you call yourself a maker, you kind of have to think that part of your quote unquote job description is to help other people in a way you know, with your knowledge or, you know, by making it like simpler or uh, you know, organizing an event, organizing a space like this one and stuff like that. So this is kind of what, you know, I, I like of what happened when uh, we worked on a tool that was supposed to help the life of basically 25 people because we teach in, in, the, in, the, in the schools where I teach, the classes are 20 people, 25 people. So we built this tool for 25 people, and now there's, oh, funny enough, there's 25 million people visit the Arduino website at least once in a year. Which is kind of a multiplied, the, the multiplying effect is a bit crazy, no? It was imagined for 20, to help 25 people, and it's like 25 million people are kind of trying to figure out what it is, or they're using it, so I'm, um, Obviously, I'm super surprised about what happened, and um, it's kind of, uh, I never thought it was going to be this big, but you know, I'm, I'm glad. But I'm more interested in also learning about what you are doing and, you know, how you use these kind of tools or how, I, you know, what it means for you to be a maker, what do you make? And um, so, are you all Arduino users here? Oh, raise your hand so I can put them in. Okay, that's pretty good. Very good. Thank you. Do, do you know how how many users, how many are how big is the user? Yeah. It's very difficult to estimate. Actually, yes. So from I think yeah. so what I meant is if you can if you wanna ask me a question, that's better. Listening to your questions and kinda of talking to you is better than being just going on and on and on and on. So I'm more interested in what you have to say. Now, the, the number of users that are part of the community is very difficult to estimate because obviously, you know, Raspberry Pi has an easy job. They are probably they don't they are the only one making it, so they know exactly how many there are. But Arduino is kind of open source, so everybody is you know either making their own Duinos or buying fake Duinos from China or something like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's okay. But, you know, it's open source hardware. As long as you don't call it Arduino, you can do whatever you want. Uh, so the, um, what I can say is that so between October 2015 and October 2016, 25 million people made at least one visit to the Arduino website. Um, there was that obviously this means that there was somebody that showed up looked at the home page and said, what is this bullshit and disclosed the router. And then people who spend maybe an hour, that the average visit duration on the Arduino website is six minutes, which for a website, it's a lot of time. Because it means that somebody opened the page and clicked it, so one second, and somebody spent the whole afternoon browsing through all the documentation, where, oh my god, what is this, you know? So there is this interesting, you know, uh, it means that, it's, that the website is a tool that you use to learn, to communicate. The forum has now many million messages posted on it. And it's available in several different languages. So, Also, the other thing that happened is that from, I think in the last year, the IDE was downloaded 11 million times. But that's not a good indication because the statistics say that there is very few people connecting from China, which is strange because when I go to China, everybody's going and doing it. So basically what I realized is that 
that there are some Chinese Arduino communities that sort of created their own Arduino website. And so I guess that a number of people download the software from a Chinese server that doesn't go to our server. So we don't know exactly how many people. It is interesting to see that in the first week that we release a new version of the IDE, we get maybe two to three million downloads. Maybe you know, one, no, sorry, 1 1.7 million downloads in the first like three, four days. And this, to me, indicates what's kind of the hardcore part of the community. It's probably one point something million people who are kind of using it. You know, it's their main tool. Then you never know, because there are a number of people who are still stuck at Arduino 1.0.6, and they don't want to update. <laughs> Which is kind of weird, you know, because it's, uh, I don't know, it's like you, you I don't know. It's like, like those people who use Word 1.0 to write documents, <laughs> and they're like, oh, I'm never upgrading, this is fantastic. Yeah, you know, the, the romantic one, the romantic one. Yeah, also the crazy also. You know the guy that writes Game of Thrones, he writes everything on an old 1980s computer that's running probably maybe MS-DOS. And everything is written on five five inches floppy disks. <laughs> like you know, if one of those floppy disks goes bad, you lose a whole season of Game of Thrones, no? Which I don't watch, so I don't care. But maybe, maybe you're you know maybe you're into that stuff, and you, so your future seasons of Game of Thrones are in the hands of a five inch floppy disk. <laughs> so some people are stuck in this one. Well, zero point six F world and like okay. So it's kind of it's not simple. Yes. Just the, I'm, I'm not a user yet. I'm, I'm still waiting for one um, shipment. But, okay. Um, but um, I just noticed when I was looking around for things like uh, you know, that there are many other uh, companies now trying to sort of mimic what you can check. Yeah. So I, I noticed that like, Intel coming up with it as well. Uh -huh. uh, what's your take on that? Uh, how do you see that impacting all the impact? Well, the, 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 the example of Intel is a good example because Intel is one of the very few, very, very few companies who said, we want to do something that's Arduino compatible, so we're not going to be bad people. We're going to talk to you and work with you. So they are the, Intel is probably the company that has been the most supportive and cooperative and works with us officially, along with uh, Samsung and Microsoft. So they really kind of work with us officially. And then obviously it's open source, so anybody can just, you know, use what we do. And obviously it sort of becomes some kind of a standard. So now even boards that's got nothing to do with Arduino, they adopt the Arduino connectors. So there was a company that made a board that was called the PC Duino. There wasn't running, it wasn't running Arduino. But he had this, the Arduino connector, so some people bought it thinking that they could program it with Arduino, and then they're like, but this is a Linux machine. Yeah. So, it's, um, uh, although the Arduino name is trademark, the problem is that if you want to really protect the trademark, you have to spend a huge amount of money. So, we don't want to spend our time protecting trademarks. Uh, yes. Where did the name Arduino come from? Okay, that's an interesting. So the um, so basically, we came up with Arduino while I was working in this town in the northwest of Italy called Ivrea. And uh, in the year 1000, there was a guy named Arduino that was born in Ivrea, and he became the first king of Italy. Obviously, he wasn't really the king of Italy because back then nobody even knew what was going on at the other side of Italy. Because there was no internet. So, so he's kind of self-proclaimed king of Italy. And then so the people in Ivrea call Arduino everything. There is the Arduino Street, the Arduino Square, the Arduino Crane Company, the Arduino Sports Club, and there's also the Arduino Bar. So that's where I used to go get drinks. <laughs> And I was like, when we have to find a name for this thing, I was like, yeah, well, let's call it Arduino like the bar, and then, you know, later on we'll figure out. <laughs> and later on, you know, that was March 17, 2005. 
and then still, still, still go down. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. I have two kids, they're five and seven. Okay. And uh, we watched a TED talk a few years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, somebody asked during the TED talk, like, can you give us a few fun projects? And uh, you mentioned a few back then. I remember that was uh, somebody had programmed Arduino to make a tax book dispenser. Yeah. Like, um, and the kids love it, and like since then, I don't know what else has been happening. Uh, can you think of anything that might be fun for the kids to look at? That I, wow. can, I can look at food. Like anything about parts and animals and all these <laughs> yeah. things. One of the examples I didn't detect of is somebody yeah. who made a chair, chair that um, tweets when you fuck. Yeah. <laughs> that was an interesting project. <laughs> 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 And they already uh, met Arduino, and like they, they're aware of a breadboard thanks to this lab. Uh, okay. We're all playing around with little things, uh -huh. but I'm not a I'm not a creative person. If you can suggest a few fun projects, maybe we can. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out what could be a good idea. Well, actually, I mean, it doesn't have to be strictly Arduino, but for example, if you look at little bits, there, there is this kit called Little Bits, where they have electronic components that you can snap together magnetically. They're designed for kids, and you can build some fun projects with it, and you don't need to do any programming or anything. So that's a very, very good way to get kids started. They do Scratch Junior, so like they're yeah. aware of the concept, but I okay. need to like create some concrete examples of what can be done. Yeah. And I'm running out of examples. Yeah, I'm trying to understand, because normally somebody who's like seven is just on the edge of being able to use Arduino because of, you know using Arduino requires you to understand written text. And so normally young kids don't uh, they're not necessarily uh, they don't understand written text until they are probably you know, seven inch uh, six, seven inch you know. and so I'm trying to at the moment I I don't have a very good idea. One of the things that we um, We've done now is that um, we, we we made this bot reading test that's called the Arduino 101, and kind of looks like the basic Arduino, but the processor on it is much more intelligent. So a couple of things it has is that it has an uh, emotion sensor, so if you move around the board, it detects movement, and it also has Bluetooth low energy. So there is this guy in the US who wrote the software that turns all the movements you do with the board into MIDI notes. So if you have a computer, you can connect the Arduino to the computer as a MIDI controller. And so as you shake it in different ways, it makes sounds. So we did a workshop uh, for adults once with that one. And it was very funny because by making some making modification to an existing code that you can find online, then kids could just you know make different sounds. And also on the computer, if you have a, you have a Mac, or yes. if you have a Mac, you just need GarageBand, which is free on the Mac, and essentially you can associate that to a specific musical instrument, and then you basically play by shaking, moving. It would be good for Christmas, actually. That's, that's a cute application that doesn't require you to actually build any circuit. Um, so that one was a, was a I, I, I used that in a workshop with adults. And, and, and you know, and, and they loved it because it's just a simple concept. You have an existing software, you just make a few modifications, and you get different variations of this. And I think that's kind of funny. I think everything that kind of makes sounds and music tends to, tends to work. Somebody years ago built like an electronic drum set using Arduino. Again, they used like old CDs, and they glued this very simple sensor, the kids all sensors to the CD, then the Arduino detects when you hit that particular old CD and send a signal to the computer which turns it into notes and plays the music. And the demonstration video was like, you know, it was like a one-year-old kid with a drumstick going <coughs> and he totally loved it. Yes. But the construction is simple because you recycle old CDs old mouse pads or something and you build it and it becomes a concept. So this kind of stuff you can find uh, on, online as projects to build. And, uh, 
Another thing that I would recommend is that there is a company in London uh, that sells also online called Technology Will Save Us. And it's started by this friend of mine. They are very, very nice, very intelligent people. And they make uh, a few kits for kids. One is like a, it's like a game console made with Arduino, but the display is an 8x8 pixel thing. So it's a very super low resolution console if you play a few video games. Another one is a kit that helps you take care of a plant. So you can connect sensor into the plant. And the third kit is a theron, so it's a musical instrument. You move the hands near the, the, the Arduino and it makes different kind of sounds. But it's a nice toy because you buy the kit, the instructions are very simple, and in one day you can assemble it with your kids and they play with it. So it's kind of a, you know, it teaches kids about the fact that you can actually build your own toys, which a lot of kids have kind of lost this idea that you build your own. You have found the stuff that you make yourself. No. Oh, yes. So, uh, we're actually doing a sort of visual interface for our video. Okay. And all we have is that, you know, on different laptops, you know, all the different uh, light views that you need to do. So, we're actually thinking of putting all those up in a server and so that you can compile the cloud. Mm -hmm. There's not no way there's any uh, licensing issue with actually aware of so, as long as you don't call it Arduino, I mean, if you call it Arduino.sg, clearly that's a problem, but... No, actually, so we, a few months ago, we launched an online version of our IDE. Yes. It's called Create. And at some point, we have in the... In, in, the, in the list of things we want to do, we have also a scratch-like interface, uh, but um, so we also produce this software called Arduino Builder. You should look, at, look it up in the, in the GitHub, it's Arduino Dash Builder. So basically we took out all the compilation part of the regular ID and we put it into a command line tool. So if you use that one to compile the code, it's exactly the same code that comes out of the Arduino ID. So, and you can put that in the cloud, and the license is very, I mean, if, if you make improvement or modification, you should share it back, but you can then put it on a server and use it. That one gives you the ability to be compiled, so you get the same exact code as the Arduino IDE, and also we add these features that make it easier for uh, Arduino to find where your libraries are, so that some parts of the compilation are better automated now. So you're doing like other IDs, like other food, you're making some ideas. Obviously, it's not sure if you're putting those IDs, you're making some other... Now, if you... I think, normally, if you put the libraries on the server in whatever format, as long as when people download it, they understand that this library is from Adafruit, they made it, that we are not claiming to own anything. But the driver is GPL, so you need to basically provide people with a link to say where you downloaded it from, so that they know that this is an Adafruit product. Adafruit is happy if you use that code, they don't complain. They only get upset where there has been a number of, you know, Adafruit are really good because they make hundreds of libraries. And they call them Adafruit underscore something, so that people understand that they have to thank Adafruit for the work. And there's a number of people who download that, they remove the Adafruit underscore, they maybe modify a couple of lines, and then they put it out as their own library. So they kind of take away the credit from Adafruit, which is not, not nice. But if you don't do that, then you're okay. okay nice. Cool. So, uh, so basically, the, most of the audience were all, they knew all about Arduino. So who, is, do you use also Arduino in your profession? Is anybody who yeah. are using it as a profession? Can, I, can you show me the hands? Oh wow, that's nice. So what do you build with Arduino? Not me, my staff. So okay. what we did was we connected the dissolved oxygen sensor to okay. the Arduino and tied it up to a actuator to turn on an aerator. Okay. So, so we put them in fish ponds and prevents fish kills from lack of oxygen. Oh wow. 
Very cool. Nice. Any other application that you build that somebody wants to talk about? Well, yes. I, I got an intern at our company uh, starting 9th of January. Uh, used to work with a Raspberry Pi. Okay. Uh, I told him uh, when it comes to the uh, switch to Arduino, because uh, I want him to work on a sensor, an air quality sensor. Yeah. I do a drone. Oh, wow. Uh, so that we can start mapping the, uh, the air quality in cities. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's so, but, uh, I, I, I'm not an expert in Arduino, so maybe you got some tips where, like, where would you be start? <laughs> well, effectively, almost any Arduino would work because you just need to store the data somewhere. We're about to launch a board which is kind of like this small, and it's basically the same processor that we have in the Arduino Zero, which is a 32-bit uh, ARM processor, and it also has a uh, micro SD connector. So you put a micro SD, you connect the sensor, and when it flies around, you download the position and the value from the sensor, you install it in the SD card, and when the drone comes back, hopefully, you take out the SD card, <laughs> and you get a CSV file to download. So to build that code is very simple, and essentially this board was designed for this kind of activity. What's the name? Well, it's going to be called MKR0. Oh. Are you protesting this? Yes. No, no, no. Oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's going to be a board. <laughs> or in the food place. A big old feather that's going to see. Question. Yes. I have a question from my friends. They're asking what's the most impactful Arduino project that they've encountered so far. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a <coughs> good question. I should prepare for this question by every month. I should decide. It's, uh, it's very difficult because every time. I feel that we found something that's very impactful, then somebody comes up with something else that's crazier. Um, I don't know, for me it's very interesting to see, for example, if you look at the open source the big printers, including the data board, they all kind of started off with Arduino as their hardware platform. And the work that this, a lot of people have done using Arduino to understand how to control motion in this kind of machines has generated a body of knowledge that gets used in 3D printers and people made CNC mini machine based on the same idea, people made open source laser cutters, uh, people made even cake decoration robots with that, somebody made a machine that tattoos your wrist, like you put your wrist, your arm inside and tattoos stuff on your arm. And it's interesting because this is all based on this very interesting phenomena of this layering of technology. So we, in a way, simplify the access to electronics and software, and then somebody starts building something that was called motion control, and they work this thing called Jojo, which is like a software that takes G code that you use in CLC machines and controls the setup motor. And then on top of that, people started to create all the different things, and they created this thing called RANKS, you know, this shield that a lot of 3D printers use RANKS. And then that particular combination of Arduino Mega plus RANKS still powers like a ton of printers. And so it's interesting how these you know, people understand and they build, and somebody else comes and builds on top of that. And then now we have a lot of these 3D printers that are enabled by the work that people have done you know, by collaborating. Uh, in different ways. So I think that's probably not, you know, like a crazy life-saving project, but it's, to me it's very important because it shows that, you know, if you work together, you can kind of create, you can create a body of knowledge that becomes useful. So if somebody wants to build some kind of a machine that's an XYZ access machine, a little like a 3D printer, they will start from zero. They can take that and build something with it. Uh, and with that kind of knowledge is an important you know, tool. Then obviously, you know, people have built uh, uh, machines to analyze the DNA, and they built uh, uh, machines that can incubate us for kids. In uh, people have built you know tools for uh, people that cannot speak, so they can you know. At the Mega Fair this year, 
if somebody built a glove for people that cannot speak, so they can use sign language, but then the Arduino, there's a circuit device from Arduino that understands the signs and uses the mobile phone to speak the words. So if somebody cannot speak, they can sign and the, and the, and the phone kind of speaks, which enables people to use sign language with people who don't understand sign language. I think it's a very important innovation, and so we gave it, we gave this project uh, 100,000 euros as a price at the Maker Fair. But the second project was somebody made a sensor that allows blind people to go on bicycles. Yeah, it was kind of like a crisis. It, it allows blind people to participate in bicycle races. Uh, so they have a special three wheel bicycle, and this sensor has a bunch of uh, sensors that detect obstacles, and so the, 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 the person rides the bike, and, and, and the sensor tells the person if there are obstacles around, and they just race. So they think that with this tool, they could have blind people racing at the Paralympics. Uh, there was another group that built um, the video game for dogs. The video game for dogs. <laughs> it's essentially a box with three buttons, and it releases little uh, pieces for dogs. So the dogs is a light on, they go, they hit with the you know, pole, and they get it. And then the more they learn how to do this, the more the game becomes complicated. So the dog has to kind of do all the sequences and everything. And apparently it keeps the dogs busy while they are born. <laughs> And then, so, so there was an interesting installation of this kind of projects, and every year there's more and more, so it's not hard to. Yes? Uh, a question. Uh, so you mentioned the Arduino 101 just now, and yeah. I read about how the Arduino 101, the chip that is on it, the Intel theory, has the potential for um, neural networks given as much. Oh, yeah. And I'm wondering, will we be able to expect Arduino having. This kind of yeah, actually you can use it now. There is a thing called the Intel Pattern Matching Library. You can tell that Intel is not really great at explaining to people how cool is the product they do. Because with this name, nobody would know what the hell is a pattern matching library. So basically what happens is that in the silicon, there is essentially a neural network implemented. There are some neurons implemented in silicon. So the idea is that you can either train the neural network directly in the Arduino 101 if you have a simple learning process that you want to do, or if you want to work on more complex stuff, you should get the data, use uh, some kind of software tool to train the neuron, and then you download the information in the network. But essentially the idea is one of the potential use that you, you connect sensor to this network, and the network can basically interpret the data from the sensors, even if the processor is off. So for example, if you are making like a fitness band by like Fitbit, the neural network can use the accelerometer because the board has a six-axis sensor. You can interpret the data. You can understand that there was a step, or somebody was running, or they were going up the steps. So, and then you count that. But you wake up the processor just to say, he took a step, or oh, she was running for two seconds. So, so by doing this, you can save dramatically uh, the power. And also, this kind of motion deconstruction algorithm, they tend to be very, very expensive. They're not open source. <coughs> so if you train the network to do it for you, it's then, you get better quality with uh, not having to license those things. And uh, at the moment, the examples that you find are mostly things like you press the button, you shape the board, and the board learns that movement. And every time you do that movement, the board says, oh, you do movement. So the examples are not exactly exciting, but they show you that there's a lot of potential in that thing. I know you don't want to see me, but... Sorry? Westworld. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Westworld. <laughs> I don't know. Westworld, I, the, the neural network is not powerful enough to create the sentient being 
Actually, what is the last episode? Is that this nine. week? Nine. Nine. The nine. Okay, yes. I was, I'm waiting for the last one. Um, yeah, no, it's not enough to create. It's probably like the equivalent of the brain of a tiny insect. But still, you can train it to do some useful stuff. And mostly, you know, you can do it uh, optimizing the power or optimizing the computing capability. So that processor has a lot of features in there. And, uh, Is anybody here a teacher of William? Have you ever taught an Arduino workshop to somebody else? Okay, good, good, good. Have you ever taught Arduino to kids? Oh wow, okay, that's great. Because you know, that, it's, it's not always easy enough to teach kids because they either like super excited or you have to kind of keep them focused. You know, did, you, did you ever you, did you ever teach Arduino to kids? What age? Youngest was my son. Okay. I was four. Oh, oh, oh. Arduino. <laughs> to like a four year old. I know the hardware. I know you're more thinking about the coding parts, but they're, they're doing the hardware no problem. My kids do it faster than I do. I think one, one, one uh, frequent asked question, which I always get. Uh, from teachers. Um, I yeah. um, one of the frequent asked questions that I always get, uh, not only as a teacher, but from teachers would be, um, yeah, all this you know is cool, but what has that got to do with education? What has that got to do with come on, I, I they will say say, oh uh, my my kids are young or we are from the arts stream, you know. What does this have to do with uh, so when you hear this kind of um, remarks, what 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 would you say to them? Oh wow. <laughs> um, well the funny thing is that sometimes you hear people say that people who are technically oriented to technology, they don't really like the arts. But I have to say that sometimes people who are into arts, they are a little bit, you know, they they kind of they don't they're not they don't say you know in a way they're also the ones who don't understand that technologies you know, it's also a creative activity and a lot of arts art is done now with technology like contemporary artists are using computers they're using electronics. One of the first community to adopt Arduino after my students were musicians building new interfaces for... Uh, there was even a conference called New Interfaces for Musical Expression. So, you know, and they, people built a bunch of stuff using things like Arduino. Uh, and a lot of the current interactive installations you find from artists are built using, you know, technology. Uh, a lot of exhibitions in museums are Arduino. Even the New York Times wrote an article like five years ago saying that if you use an Arduino, you could build uh, installations for museums that would you know, be cheap. And so one of the things that I think is very interesting that's happening right now is that if you use something like Arduino to teach, for example, you can <coughs> You tend to use a lot of the knowledge that you have all in the same place. Like a lot of teaching, unfortunately, is still divided by subjects. So you do things in arts, and then you do math, and then you do literature, and then you do, and you do it like all, you know, we call them silos. Sometimes you know, they're separated, no? Well, if you're building a project using Arduino, you might need to put together some of your understanding of physics, because you're trying to make something move. You know, I was, once I was trying to build some kind of a, a robotic arm to draw something on paper, and I realized that, oh, wow, now I have to remember all those trigonometry formulas that I always hated when I was a student. Why did I hate them? Because people taught me those trigonometry formulas without ever explaining to me why would I need them. 
And then I have the problem that I have an XY coordinate and I have to turn between two and three angles. I say, oh, take a moment. Duh. So, you know, <laughs> so in a way, this kind of project-based learning, learning by doing, has the advantage that you put together all your knowledge and then suddenly you move from one discipline to another. Let's say that you're trying to make some kind of a, a toy that uses physics and then uses music. Then you need to produce sound from the Arduino. You're like, oh, I need to make a sound. So I need to know about frequency, and I need to know about notes, I need to know about tempo, and all these kinds of things. So suddenly, all your things you learn in music, they go into your project. So building projects with this kind of technology, in my opinion, is very powerful because it teaches kids that when you're trying to solve the problem, you bring in everything you know about life. That's why, for example, say the farmer learning about Arduino. Because, in a way, they bring some life skills about that subject that, unless you're also a farmer, you don't know. Or you have to ask. Sorry? I saw a little video. So I teach the robot is exposed to music and what? Okay. And there's a few boards. So the thing now is a lot of students are very excited to do scratch programming. Yeah. But the thing is, a lot of students want to learn syntax. But in schools, teachers do not allow the students to learn syntax. So what do you think, in your just experience, kids should learn syntax for you? Yes. Well, um, I mean, scratch is really good if you're a young kid, you get going really quickly. Uh, but then obviously there is a point where if you become an expert, there's also a question of productivity. So if you're an expert, then you start to want to... Um, I know there has been, there have been people who have built tools for Arduino where like, even the Mbot tool shows you the Arduino code generated. So that one is a good idea because once you build a project and you kind of start because it's too complicated, then you generate the code, you cut and paste it into Arduino and you continue. And then, kind of, you know, then kids can map the blocks to the code. But they need to get to the point that they are trying to do something that they cannot do with a different tool, and then they are motivated. Even with adults, it's like when I started teaching, the first lectures I did it the way I saw people teaching in university. So I started to teach people about electricity, electrons, current, atoms. And then everybody was you know, getting distracted, they were browsing the internet with the Wi-Fi. I thought, oh wow, either I turn off the Wi-Fi or I become a different teacher. So I decided for the second option. And I realized that you know, when I was a kid, I learned by doing things. And when I started learning what voltage is as a kid, was the moment something I was trying to do required me to learn about voltage. So in that particular context, that piece of knowledge connected with my situation, and I was open to that concept. But if I try to learn a bunch of things completely in abstraction, with no connection with my life, at some point this knowledge goes away. So if the kids get to the point that they want to do something, but they can't do it because the visual tool cannot do it, in that moment they are ready to invest the energy to move to the text okay. Yes? If you had to put Arduino and all of these things in one sentence, I would have never heard of it before. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people ask me this about what is making. I can't define it. Mm. Well, there is an official definition of making, which is kind of boring. Uh, it is difficult to create like a simple one sentence definition. Also because I noticed that in the maker community, a lot of people have a different way to think about it. To me, the important part is that uh, it is, in a way, a movement that is connected strongly with essentially a DIY attitude, so do-it-yourself attitude, uh, which is essentially a technological extension of the DIY community. Which, in a way, is um, uses different, you know, learning by doing and this kind of uh, constructive is a little bit too technical as a term. But 
But in education, these methods are called constructive. You, know, you build up your knowledge. But in a way, so the idea is essentially it's a DIY community that embraces every activity with a technological angle. So they use digital technologies to be able to achieve certain amount of goals. The people who do this are not necessarily an expert trained in that field uh, of technology. They may be somebody that's interested in other technology, and they use in the field, they use technology, and they do a lot of learning by doing, learning by making projects. So it's hands-on learning. And I think another aspect that makes Maker different from other previous communities is that this learning from other people, it's also called peer-to-peer -peer learning, happens because makers use the internet, they communicate with people, um, the number of makers have taken complex concepts, learned them with a lot of pain, and then wrote articles online to explain them in a different language, making it easier for other people to do that. And so, I don't know, I, should, I think I should sit down and probably try to come up with a very elegant phrase to describe this. At the moment, I don't. There's a couple of people who ask, a couple of different publishers who ask me to write a book about makers. But that would require me to do all this kind of thinking and come up with clever definitions and <laughs> intelligent ideas. And, and so sometimes, yes. Uh, but just to give you an example, I think, you know, um, when I started working on microcontrollers, uh, before I made Arduino, I was working with pick chips. Uh, because, you know, before I started teaching, I was working in an, I was working and I was doing software for a long, long time. And then I was working in an investment fund, in a venture capital fund. And after that, I said, okay, this is not for me. I don't like this. I want to go do something that has got something to do with, you know, making something and maybe helping people. So I started teaching in the school. And so I used pictures because they were the very, the most easy one to find on the market because Italians were using the pitches to hack satellite TVs so they could watch the, the football games. <laughs> <laughs> so they, you could buy them anywhere. But then after a while, I, we found a lot of limitation in the pitches and we wanted something that would have a good free open source C compiler. And in the end, we ended up using the APRs because one of my sort of in way mentors, yes, yeah, uh, the user bank told me, have a look at the AVR. But I think the reason why we ended up using it is because the whole community, which was not called makers back then, read all the AVR documentation, which wasn't beautifully written, digested it, and they wrote a ton of articles that explained the same stuff in a language that humans could understand. <laughs> so we started to work with AVRs. Uh, for, 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 so for that reason, because the documentation was you know, available uh, in a format that wasn't the official data sheet, but also articles by people explaining how to do things. So I think in a way, you know, this uh, it's a community that we're kind of helping each other. It's kind of part of the, the sharing is part of the, the package. Since you talk about AVR, uh, as someone who is hoping to go beyond Arduino and looking into like data design and stuff, is there a, like easy or rather a relatively easier introduction into the data uh, systems? Yeah, by using Arduino, is that better development? Yeah, but like beyond having a coding and doing like into basic C or something. When you when you use Arduino, you're doing C++. So the question is that, unfortunately, there's a bunch of people who call themselves professional developers, where not all of them are professional, but some of them call themselves professional. They basically say, oh, Arduino is not a real thing, so you're not doing a bad You're doing a bad thing. It's C++. So you can actually take it out of the Arduino ID and use a command line if you want. And there's a bunch of people that use Arduino to build actual products. Somebody even wrote an article a few, maybe a year ago, saying that they were using Arduino in industrial equipment, and they thought that it was functioning, it was so vast, and that people should stop 
in a way considering Arduino just by prototyping to <coughs> because it, it's kind of stable and, and one of the advantages of Arduino gives you is that uh, it's just it's productivity you know? uh, and it's interesting because this company Siemens made this small industrial computer that's based on the Intel Galileo and the official documentation so shows you how to use the official Intel IDE for this processor. And the setup, setting up the development environment takes the first 20 pages of the manual. 20 pages of like hardcore C language to click an ID. Option B, you take a USB cable, you plug it in this thing, you download Arduino, you select Intel Galileo Generation 2, select Blink, press the button, 30 seconds later, then he is big. So the instructions, you can write them in a fortune cookie in a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> you snap it, and the instructions are on the fortune cookie. So to me, that was very important, because I know a lot of people who develop software that goes into industries, they run companies, and they have been doing software in different ways, and they will have a lot of, they would waste a lot of time trying to learn and play the development kind of, you know, old style, while Arduino allows them to be productive today, you know? So, one of the things, obviously, you want to do is um, maybe start looking at the ARM-based Arduinos or the Intel-based Arduinos, because they are more powerful. Uh, also, the interesting thing is that if you start with Arduino and you make it an e link, if you, um, if you look at the place where you keep your sketch, Arduino converts the code into full-blown C++ and then compiles it. And you can even keep the assembly language that was compiled. So if you want, you can use the Arduino code to see from the function to the binary. And then you can open the source code and go, oh, sorry, digital write. Okay, good, cool. let's, let's look at it what digital drive does. And by looking at the source code, you can then go back and understand every single thing that's happening to the code down to the metal. Which is something that you might not be able to do with other tools because they don't get the source or the source is insane, it's made of like a million files. So in a lot of schools, they use Arduino to teach them better development. Because if you look at the 8-bit ADRs, the code is so simple that a bachelor student can learn everything in a few days from high level to what happens in the processor. So yeah, I think you can make more comp you can make use more complex Arduino, but you can use Arduino as a way to move to more complicated. example to me is Microsoft. So Microsoft used to be, officially, from the outside, the worst enemy of open source. There is the famous Halloween memo against freedom, that's like makes the history of open source. And, um, and now I work with Microsoft. Uh, they, are, they are completely different. Now they completely, they are so sold on the open source concept that they say to me that now they are an open source company that then selectively decides to protect source code. Before they were a proprietary company selectively releasing. They even shut down the open source group they had because now they don't need a separate open source group. Every team I work with releases code. They release the code for everything, you know, for .NET. For so in a way, there's, obviously they don't release the code for everything, everything, but uh, uh, but they're, you know, they made a huge transformation because they see the multiplication, the value multiplies with open source. 
Um, last year we participated in a study that people were making about uh, Internet of Things developers. And this survey was like a worldwide survey of thousands of developers. And they estimated that there were 4.5 million people in the world that define themselves IoT developers. And they defined that around 80% of them felt that either they would only work with open source, or they only work with open source tools, or they ex even ex you know, imagine to open source part of their technology. So in a way, right now, any sane company knows that in order to convince developers to use your technology, you have to make it open source. Even you have to make the, the, the knowledge available. Right? So back in the days, like, there was this company, Broadcom, that was making this Wi-Fi module. They were, like, they are still making that. They are still very, uh, you know, probably some of the best Wi-Fi chips. But the documentation was impossible to actually to, to get. Then they sold this kind of uh, division to Cypress, and one of the first things that Cypress did was to open all the documentation and put it online. And your know, openness of information, open source clearly multiplies the value of whatever problem you're doing. And uh, I think there's less and less people that can defend uh, not being open source. Clearly, there are situations where you should keep some code not open. Because uh, we have to be honest and admit that the open source community, it's not always, not always everybody plays uh, a fair game, you know? There's a lot of people in there that are basically, they take from the open source community, but they don't give anything back. And the people who are making this, you know, compatible Arduino boards, and they're making hundreds of thousands of them, they are using all the work that we did, and they don't contribute anything back. And if you email them and say, okay, you're copying Arduino, can you at least put the files for the board online? Sometimes they don't even reply to you, sometimes they tell you, you know, get lost. But so clearly there is a problem right now in the open source world that there's a lot of people that are not playing fake. They are taking from all of us. They're also taking money, but they're not either giving back software or work, or they're not giving back money. So that's one issue we have in the open source work right now, is to remind people that open source work is we both share. If only one shares and the other one you know, catches the money, you know, it doesn't work. Yes? No, no. It took many, many years. At the beginning, I think me and my uh, co-founder, David Quartiers, we put a grand total of 700 euros. Uh, which was probably like a thousand dollars to buy one, a few, and three hundred PCBs that people could use to assemble the one or two, you know. And then, after a while, we kind of got some money together to build one hundred USB Arduinos fully mounted, and it was very slow at the beginning, you know. It was slow. It we spent a lot of time explaining to people what Arduino was, and so it was very gradual. Um, so I remember that in 2006, when we sold the first 10,000 Arduino, Make Magazine made an art, wrote an article about it. Because it was like a big news in the maker community. In 2006, somebody selling 10,000 units was like, you know, when Apple makes an Apple, it was just, oh my god, 10,000 So it was very, very, very slow. 
And it requires a lot of work from our part. Like at the beginning, we spent an insane amount of time going around Europe, convincing people to use Arduino, teaching free workshops, you know, sleeping on somebody's floor and, and doing all this kind of stuff to get people to adopt Arduino. And, um, and working on the website to make the documentation accessible. And then slowly, some people start to use Arduino, they start to build good projects, they start to share the fact that they use Arduino to build those projects, and the people say, oh, well, what's Arduino? And then it's got a multiplying effect. So, you know, now it's 11 years that we have released Arduino, so it takes a few years. And at the beginning, a lot of people are like, you do it, this is stupid. So, like the people who do like professional development, like Arduino is stupid while you're wasting your time with this. Yes? Do you think of taking wearable uh, electronic projects you've seen on the internet or you came across the designer that you design with? So, yes, there's a, there's a lot of projects in that area. There's actually a product called Arduino Lilypad that people use a lot for that. Anything that was enough to impress you in any way? There's a lot of nice projects that are based on like turning maybe clothing into like displays or using them as sensor to make music or stuff. I mean, there's a nice, lot of nice things like that. Like there was a fashion designer from Milan. She made this corset that uses nitinol, um, uh, it's like a special metal that can contract and expand, it. so that this kind of the corset expands and contracts, teaching you how to breathe properly. Or it uses sensors to gather like air quality and stuff like that, and can use that so the clothing. So it was interesting because that the, the corset was kind of displaying data but he was also kind of teaching you how to breathe properly. So there are some interesting projects like that. I think right now the problem is that the technology is still a little bit rudimentary. So these processes are very simple. There's not a lot of... Uh, a lot of projects are made with like connecting an Arduino to a lot of LEDs and giving that in your face. So I wouldn't really define that as fashion. It's kind of, you know, they're kind of tacky. That's not like in the real world to, 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 to use that in fashion properly. So there's still a lot of work to do also on the tools. The tools are still too rudimentary. They're not also in electronics. You know, you have to design it properly because then you cannot really take the clothing and put it in the washing machine. So, you know, there's still quite a bit of work to do to make the next step after this generation of products, which were brilliant work by this woman called uh, Lydia Bickley. And it was also a lot of work, but especially they are the same, they didn't really progress beyond that. Yes. Oh, yeah, you. Oh, sorry. So, hi. Like, um, if you meet somebody who doesn't know and isn't going to be able to see everything. Oh, wow, yes. That's another thing that I should. Well, you know, to me, to, Arduino, to me, Arduino is a tool that allows people to use electronic as a creative medium. So maybe it's a little bit too. Uh, but in a way, you know, it, it allows people with no backgrounds in electronics or software to be able to use electronics to be creative and innovative. And so I, I, I never really perfected a better electrical pitch because people also use Arduino for all sorts of different things. So my generic electrical pitch sometimes doesn't apply to what they do. So depending on who I talk to, I give them, I give them a different interpretation. But to me, it's a tool that enables people with no background in electronics or programming to use electronics to be creative and innovative. That's like a generic approach. Yes? Uh, what do you think about projects that have uh, a main that are 
Oh wow. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I, I have a strange relationship with projects, as in like so when I uh, when I stopped teaching in Israel because the school closed, um, and before Arduino was able to give me enough money to to make a living, I did a lot of projects. I was working a lot in exhibition design in the land. And so in the land, there was a number of events during the year where people build installations of different kinds. So I was building a lot of those kind of interactive installations. Uh, uh, so that's when I did like the most projects. Then, then there's a number of things I did with my, my students that are... So in a way, now I build a few projects that are most before me or for, learn, for understanding what's needed. I think one of the interesting projects I built back in the days when we were developing Arduino is that with one of my friends who was a student back then, we developed a wallpaper that can work as a display. So the, uh, a wallpaper that's like a, it's, it's, it's a display. So essentially imagine there was a wall that was like four meter by two meter covered in wallpaper, but then you could turn the paper from black to white, and there were every pixel was like 50, uh, yeah, five centimeters, basically. And you could use it as a display, you could write things on the wall, and we developed that for Prada, for, for their store in uh, Beverly Hills. Well, we developed it as the thesis project of this student, Dario Rossini. And then after that, we showed it to Prada. Prada gave us some money to develop it. Then in the end, they even put it into the store. Uh, but we still had a four meter by two meter prototype that we showed to a lot of people. And one of the application was that people would send you a text message, and this the Arduino would read the text message and display it on the wallpaper as a big gigantic message. That one was. Uh, that one was, uh, I, we, that we worked on it a lot to develop all the technology to be able to control the pixels, and I we did a lot of work on that. Yes? You built Arduino, right? What was your drive as an entrepreneur to really uh, make your idea into reality? And what is your advice for young people? Young entrepreneurs. Well, when, we, when I started working on Arduino, essentially, I joined this design school and I was teaching students how to use electronics and the tools were kind of, you know, either they only worked on Windows, uh, they were expensive, um, uh, and also there was this problem that we used a board called the basic stack, which was a genius idea when it came out, but the problem was that importing it from the US, go to Duke is something, there would be something that would be less powerful than an Arduino Mini, and it costed a hundred dollars. And for that time, it was considered a fairly cheap piece of hardware. Because everything else that did kind of embedded development was much more expensive. So the problem was that if a student buys something that costs a hundred dollars, they're not going to make a lot of prototypes, because they're going to be constantly afraid of blowing this thing up. And so if they don't do prototypes and they're afraid, they don't create. Because the only way to have a good idea is to have 99 shitty ideas, and then suddenly, like idea number 100, is like, oh, wow, this is good. But it's not that you wake up in the morning and the first idea is good. You have to go through the 99 crap ideas in order to get to number 100. So you need to make a lot of prototypes. You need to be unafraid of blowing things up. You need to be in a position that you feel you can fix also the things you do. So that's why Arduino still has this chip that you can replace. So we started to, I started to bring the tools for my students, first with the big chips and everything else, and the students did a thesis where we started using the ADRs and then we developed like the part of the, part of the, some of the commands in Arduino. Uh, then we made Arduino. So in a way it was kind of a, we did, there was an identifiable problem, 
the identifiable problem was not immediately perceived as something that could make money. So sometimes when you try to create something successful, you have to identify the problem and try to kind of work towards solving that problem. But don't be limited by the fact that now you cannot make money. Because back in those days, there was the perception that there was not money to be made with Arduino because professional developers thought that it was something they would use. Now the issue is, if those are not your customers, you don't care what they think. So they made fun of us and they said that we were stupid and we made people stupid because our real stupid. And the examples are still there on the, the web is great because stuff stays. So the people who told me that Arduino was um, a baby talk language for pop heads, which, you know, because a lot of Americans speak, but obviously artists are people who smoke drugs. No? And somebody defined Arduino a tool for artists, women and painters. Which was like, what the you know? So there was a lot of, quote unquote, there's only racism towards making stuff simple for people. And you know, so the professional developers thought it was a stupid idea, but that was not the market. So then we ended up creating millions of people who do a better development that completely outnumber their professional developers. And now they challenge their market. Because some people started to realize that you know, a lot of problems can be solved with a on the And so in a way, sometimes if you are a young entrepreneur, you, you, should, you should not be limited by the fact that the current way of doing something tells you that your project might not have a success because maybe you're trying to work towards another group of people that we haven't understood yet that the tool is changing their life. So clearly that requires you to maybe have another way to support your income why people understand what you do. Okay, here I have last question. Oh wow, last question. It's important. Now, Very last. important. Okay, if not, I will have... Okay. Last question. Yes, yeah, so... Uh, and that question uh, related to business, yeah, so, uh, I mean, okay, originally you have engineers creating some cool stuff. Uh, what was your journey in terms of marketers and scaling? Because, uh, well, you know, engineering cool stuff, I mean, okay, it's firm, it's working, it works well, it works, you know, good, that's a problem, but uh, marketing has a little bit different approach, you know, it's a bit maybe different creativity, but you cannot say whether white is bad, white is good, or black is bad. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so um, what was the journey of your team in particular in this front? Well, so it's interesting, you know, I have a background in engineering. I started electrical engineering, but then I dropped out of university, so I actually don't have a degree. Which is kind of fun. Actually, I do have a degree now, but it's uh, essentially ceremonial. I have, a, I have a honorary degree, I have a honorary PhD uh, in education. In education, which for me, when that happened, some of my friends are like, oh no, they didn't give you a. That's what, that's exactly what these people, they, give, they understood. This is not about electronics, it's not about software, it's about tools for teaching people about... So I was very honored to receive that. The University of Bath. I get to dress like Henry VIII. It was kind of like an Harry Potter situation <laughs> where you kind of walk into the Abbey, you know, and say, like, wow. You know, so it was kind of a weird. It was very, very, I was super honored. The other guy who got the honorary degree the same day was uh, uh, John Keats from, you know, from Montemagno. So it was a very good, very good, very good. So apart from me not having a degree, uh, I did software for a long time. Um, but I always worked with designers. And also being from Milan, I always kind of had a new people that were either designers or 
worked at designers, I dated designers. So, you know, in different ways, I was in a way at the crossroad of being an engineer or understanding what designers do, appreciating what they do, and, and, uh, and working with them. Because we did, I did a lot of websites in my past career, so I was working with a lot of graphics designers. So that's why when I went to give the interview to go to this school in Rea, they tried to keep, ask me some quick questions to see if I understood about design, and I was able to, you know, to show that I understood uh, enough of design to be there. Um, so in a way, uh, I uh, this thing was was created at the beginning, not for it was never. The idea to create this for engineers. It's always for people that are not engineers. The engineers already know how to use it. You know? They already know how to do stuff, so they don't need they they didn't they don't need Arduino. Then they use it. But some engineers they use Arduino in the closet. They don't tell their families, they don't tell their friends. <laughs> so then they use it. Because my theory is that Arduino helps be makes beginners, enables beginners and speeds up engineers. So I know engineers that they use Arduino to kind of sketch something very quickly, and then maybe they rebuild it in some other tool they use for work. But Arduino keeps that speed. So to beginners, it gives you simplicity, so professionals gives you speed. So in a way, it was that was the weird thing, no? like it's an embedded development tool created in a design school by technically a guy that never graduated. Uh, an engineer who was also some kind of an anarchist, uh, you know, my friend, I think, what he is. A guy whose degree is in theater lighting, Tom Igo, who teaches at the ITP, before learning about you know, doing the masters at NYU, he, he was basically doing lighting in theater. So, you know, it was like a group of random people with weird ideas. So I guess, I don't know if I answered your question, more or less. No, that's your experience. Right? Yeah. Also, I would say it's interesting the use of the word marketing, because there are some, it's, when, I have to, when I deal with some, some, no, some engineers, they consider the word marketing is like some kind of an insult. Oh, yeah. They say, oh, marketing. It's like saying, your mother is questionable morality. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, well, effectively, the very problem of everything that you create in life is that if nobody knows that you are a genius, if you are a genius by yourself in your room, it doesn't help anybody. You will be frustrated if you think you're a genius and nobody understands what you do. So you, if you do something that's useful, that adds to society, it is your duty to spend time explaining to people what you do. And if people don't understand what you do, it's not their fault, it's your fault. If you people don't understand what you say and what you do, it's your fault. You cannot say, oh, nobody understands the genius. No. You are a bad communicator. Nobody understands what you add to society because you don't able to explain it. And then obviously, engineers, oh, that's marketing. To me, it's about, you know, if you have ideas, they need to be communicated, you need to convince people to adopt these ideas. That's why sometimes people adopt stupid ideas because there are people that have very little ability to think, but they're really good at selling their shitty ideas. So we need more intelligent people that are also able to sell intelligent ideas. Otherwise, the world will still adopt stupid ideas. That's the... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, maybe like I'm doing, yes. You know, other people will do projects that challenge the status quo in a certain area of human society. And people will say, oh, that is stupid, that doesn't, you know, doesn't make any sense. So obviously you have to be prepared. You know, I get a lot of criticism. People write me hate emails, you know. Uh, people even be like, oh, I hope that your shitty company fails and I'm going to see you cry. <laughs> you know, so, anyway. 
Thank you. Uh, we still have a bit of time, and I just want to invite anyone who would like to, you know, express some form of uh, gratitude, like how Arduino have changed your life. And this is this is this is important because 